Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks very much indeed for, for joining us this morning for another in our series of uh, real estate investment market outlooks, um, where we're going to take a look at uh, what's going on around the world, focusing in here on the, the market in uh, Asia Pacific. Um, and later on, I have a, a panel of distinguished friends and colleagues uh, who I hope you're going to store up some very interesting and challenging questions for. One of the components um, that, that we have uh, within the, the presentations today, uh, which we're going to start with, is the launch of uh, the latest version of IPD's uh, Pan-Asia Returns Research. Um, we've been working, CBRE's been working with IPD for uh, many years. I'm uh, a, a, an old friend of theirs having used their information extensively in Europe. It, it really is no exaggeration to say that, that particularly in the UK, but increasingly across Europe, um, IPD really has transformed the landscape in terms of the way investment managers benchmark their performance and in terms of the way in which uh, the real estate community is able to look at in, uh, and analyze uh, real estate because of the work that they've done. And the Pan-Asia returns research is one of the early attempts from IPD to extend their services uh, into the Asia market and provide some, some very interesting insights into uh, how returns uh, are, are coming together and, and how the market's performing uh, relative to other regions and, and for, to different countries. So we're going to kick off um, with Dr. Kevin Swaddle, uh, the Managing Director of IPD here in Asia Pacific. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning, uh, not only to act as Nick's warm-up man for his presentation, but to launch this, the third edition of IPD's PARR, the Pan-Asia Return Research. This is actually the uh, fourth presentation of these results that uh, I've given since last uh, uh, Friday in Japan where the results were globally launched. There's also been one in, in London. Um, it's a project that we began uh, more than three years ago. Uh, we've de uh, developed a five-year history and I'll be taking you through those numbers in just a moment. First, I must, as always, express my gratitude to all of the organizations that have provided IPD data that has gone into the research, but especially I must thank the organizations that are shown here on the screen that have supported our research this year. CBRE itself, uh, Invesco Real Estate, uh, the Japan Real Estate Institute, JP Morgan Asset Management, and the Sumitomo Mitsui Research Institute. Just to give a little bit of uh, context to the Asia numbers that I will present in just a moment. I want to say a little bit about IPD um, because I know that we're not known by everyone in this region uh, and about the IPD Global Index that was launched last month. Uh, Nick has given a bit of a flavor to IPD's work so I won't go into great detail. I just wanted to make particularly two points, uh, which is that there are two quite distinct halves to the work IPD does. There is the public side, which is manifested in the market indices that we're probably best known for, and the uh, Pan-Asia real estate research, although not formally described as an IPD index, is certainly in that category. But actually, the largest part of IPD's work, and certainly, uh, certainly it's where our revenue comes from, is the private side, which is the work that we do for individual investors and managers to analyze their portfolios and provide them with like-for-like uh, -like benchmarks for their real estate exposure. The IPD Global Index, then, um, this is the way that it is weighted. This is the weighting applied, not the actual structure of the database. Um, 
uh, but uh, the database globally is in excess of 1.5 trillion dollars, US dollars of real estate. Going into the global index, um, the largest individual country is the United States, not surprisingly. Uh, Japan, at 15%, is the second largest. Uh, the whole of Europe accounting for about 17%, um, uh, outside the Eurozone, and the Eurozone, a number 22%. In, over the last few years, we've seen the pattern of uh, real estate performance. This graph shows the capital return of the 25 national markets that IPD monitor over a five-year period, splitting them out into two groups. Those that have uh, fallen um, following the uh, Lehman Brothers and the global financial crisis, but have now started to recover in value. That's the group that we can see there, led by South Africa on the left. And on the right, the group of markets that actually have seen no capital recovery since the, um, since the GFC, and whose values at the end of 2011 were still falling. And uh, the most extreme case we can see there is, uh, is Ireland. In 2011, um, and we see here first the 2010 returns and the wide range of national market total returns, uh, there were losers, most notably the UK. The uh, 2010 best performer was down significantly. And there were winners, uh, countries whose performance had moved significantly ahead of the 2010 position and actually of the 25 countries where IPD has a full market index, it was uh, Canada that in 2011 was the best performer. Ireland again being the, uh, the least good performer. Applying the weighting that I showed you a moment ago to the returns in the previous graph, uh, we get a pattern for global real estate performance that looks like this. And we can s clearly see the recession at its deepest in 2008, 2009, recovery in 2010, and a global total return in 2011 of 9.8%, which IPD splits out uh, into a capital return of 3.7%, and quite a, a healthy, or at least high, uh, income return of 5.9%. These three metrics, a total return, income return, and capital return, are ones that we will see again during the course of the presentation. The numbers, to be clear, that I'm showing you are the return from direct real estate. The assets have been extracted from whatever structure they happen to be held in, whether it's a private equity fund, a REIT, a property company, or a private portfolio. Um, we've looked at their rent and the change in value to produce a real estate return on an unleveraged basis. And except where I say otherwise, all of the numbers that I will be showing you are on that basis. I mentioned that the Global Index has uh, 25 countries and is made up only of markets where IPD has a fully-fledged IPD index. In Asia-Pacific, there are just four markets that fit that description, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. The research I'm presenting today uh, uses the data for uh, Japan and Korea, but also has a substantial volume of data that we've collected for other markets around Asia. Uh, we can see the countries there, um, nine countries in all, because we exclude for the purpose of this research Australia and New Zealand. But of course they can be added in to produce uh, specific benchmarks that require those markets. The database that we have constructed at the end of 2011 was worth 244.3 B 
billion US dollars, which was up quite significantly, up almost 20% on its value a year earlier. A proportion of that was due to the capital growth of the assets, but the largest part was the sourcing of new data to go into uh, the index from new participants. The national breakdown of the database looks like this. These are the actual weights, uh, the way in which that 244 billion is broken down. Fully a half comes from Japan, which uh, we might debate this later, but I would contend is still by far the largest part of the Asia real estate market. Hong Kong uh, represents the next largest component at 18%, uh, Singapore at 16%. The uh, China representation at 4% may not look a lot, but it is actually 10.5 billion US dollars worth of real estate. And more significantly, it is double the representation that was in our last, um, last a release of this research, so we're quite pleased with the way that that's going. The sector breakdown um, is that the database is fully a half offices, a quarter retail, and the remaining quarter is split between industrial and residential and other property. That's the average. Uh, it's notable that the individual country weights by sector um, vary um, sometimes quite significantly from that structure. Um, and there's a notable uh, difference between what I might call the more developed mark uh, investment markets uh, like Hong Kong, Japan, and Korea that have uh, a higher weighting in the office sector and the more developing investment markets like China, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, uh, that have a tendency to, be, to have greater representation in the retail sector. So let's look at the, the actual uh, returns that we've generated. Um, of the uh, six runners up, um, Indonesia was the highest um, with 15.2% and Japan had the lowest returns at 34 you can see that there is something very obvious that all three markets have in common, and that's clearly that they are all markets in one way or another very closely associated and influenced by China. In third place was Taiwan with a return of 16.4%. Uh, China mainland was actually second with a return of 18%, and it was where we are today, uh, Hong Kong, that had for the second year in a row the highest total return at 22.3%. If we add the Asia countries into the array of uh, markets in the IPD uh, that we've already looked at in the IPD Global Index, uh, we can see that they, and let's put Australia and New Zealand as uh, honorary members of the region in green, um, we can see that Asia, in global terms, in 2010, uh, performed very well indeed. Indeed, uh, five out of the top seven markets were in this region. This is the weighting of the countries that we saw just a moment ago. Uh, that's actually not the weighting we've applied in producing the regional composite. We've kept Japan at 50%, but we've uh, downweighted uh, Hong Kong and Singapore because the size of our databases is more about ease of access to data than their, the size of their investment markets. Uh, so we've actually given uh, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Korea all an equal weighting um, at 9%, and the other markets have got smaller weightings. Uh, it's a debate we might have in the panel discussion or, uh, or, or in questions, but uh, nobody actually knows the definitive answer about what the size of the investment real estate market is in Asia. 
and uh, applying actual weights is not something you can do. Um, I would argue that it's actually an academic debate because for producing a benchmark for any individual fund, we would apply a different set of weights applicable to that fund anyway. But these are the weights that we've applied for the index. And we can see with those weightings that clearly Japan's return at 3.4% will have a bigger influence on the composite uh, than either China or Hong Kong. And as a result, the overall figure that um, we've put for Pan-Asia is 8.4%. Compared with the previous year, we can see most markets are up. Uh, Taiwan is up quite significantly. Um, Singapore down slightly, and Hong Kong, in spite of being uh, the best performing market, is actually very slightly down on the level that we had for it in 2010. The total return, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is always split between an income and a capital component. And across Asia, we're putting a 2.7% capital return and a 5.6% uh, income return, very slightly down on the global average. Reordering the markets in order of their income return, we can see Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Japan having the lowest income returns, and some very high um, income returns in the case of uh, Indonesia and Thailand, markets that have seen falls in capital value. Um, and uh, I was comforted to see um, some CBRE figures that corroborated uh, in part those, uh, those quite high uh, income returns and cap rates. Uh, the capital return, we're reordering the countries again. And uh, just to try and begin analyzing this number, I've included the inflation rate in each of the countries there uh, so that we can split out the uh, nominal capital return into a real, uh, real growth uh, represented by the light blue bars. Taking inflation out of the capital return uh, pushes a few more markets into a negative real capital return, notably Korea and Singapore. But the message that stands out uh, most loudly is that it is those three top markets, the China markets, Taiwan, mainland China, and Hong Kong, that are seeing the largest element of capital growth. Turning to the sectors of the market, in 2011, it was retail property that was the best performer with a return of 11.2% followed by offices at 7.5% and industrial property. The individual uh, sector country returns um, are quite interesting um, because the average um, return for uh, the retail property as being the best performer, um, when you look at the individual markets, it's actually office property that is the best performer in uh, three out of the top five cases, office property representing in, uh, represented in this graph by the, uh, the pink bars, uh, retail in the blue. So we now have a five-year history for this research. Um, these are the total returns in each of the last five years. And the annualized, the compound annualized return uh, for the Pan-Asia region was 6.2%. When we break that out between the income and capital components, the income return is clearly the largest part of that return, with several years having seen negative capital uh, returns. Uh, so 5.3% for, uh, for the income return and just 0.9% capital growth over the full five years. Uh, the total returns over longer periods by the individual markets, uh, again, not so dissimilar from the pattern of 2011, uh, with China and um, 
and Hong Kong over five years being amongst the best performers, Japan the least good performer. Over three years uh, represented in um, the purple color there, um, Hong Kong is again the best performer, but Indonesia, um, a much smaller market, is the second placed market. And over uh, five years, uh, interestingly, in the green, you can see Korea as the third best performing market. By sector, um, the order of the sectors over five years is actually the same as in 2011, but the grouping of the sectors is somewhat narrower. Retail at 8.5% is ahead of both office at 5.9% and industrial at 5.3%, but the grouping of those uh, second and third placed markets are clearly much closer. And when you look at the pattern of performance over the years, we can see the much more volatile performance of the office market. So perhaps on a risk-adjusted basis, you might be looking to the in industrial sector as being the more stable uh, performer. Currency makes a big difference to the returns generated by an individual investor because no real investor would ever take home the weighted average local currency return that we're showing because of the currency effects in repatriating that return back into their home currency. When you take currency into account, um, the local currency return represented by the bar, the return achieved in US dollars by the blue line, we can see that for the US dollar investor, the five-year return rises uh, from 6.2% to 11.4% because of the generally weakening of the US dollar over this period against the basket of other currencies. By contrast, the return achieved by the Japanese yen investor, the yen having strengthened um, in most years over this five-year period, falls to 3.2%. And how is Asia compared with other regions of the world? Uh, again, the Pan-Asia return represented by the bar. The return from a United States real estate uh, back on a local currency basis is represented by the, uh, the blue line. Although US real estate over the last two years has uh, actually quite significantly outperformed the Asian basket, most uh, most of that performance was actually a rebound from the disastrous years of 2008 and 2009, so that over a five-year period, um, the U.S. real estate performance at just 2.3% is significantly below Asia. The same is true, um, but slightly less volatile, of the European market. When I did this uh, similar presentation last year, the question that I was asked was, what happens if you exclude Japan from the composite? Uh, so this year I have done that, and the answer is that the return for Asia excluding Japan actually goes up quite a lot. In 2010, 2011, it gives you a return that is similar to the high return of the United States, uh, and over a five-year period, with a return of 11.3%, we have a very significant outperformance of all of the other regions. So we now have the start of a, a database. Um, we're not calling it an index yet, but uh, I hope that it will have, or parts of it will have, the status of a full IPD index within too many years. Um, but we already have something that we can start using as a practical tool for creating benchmarks. Because with a few caveats, you can start doing all of those things, all of those analyses that we do in other parts of the world for investment portfolios. 
both at our direct level and also using the data um, for creating uh, benchmarks for individual funds at fund level. Uh, the way that we reweighted the database to exclude Japan gives a clue as to the way that you can reweight the different components of the Pan Asia returns to create a series that mirrors the structure of an individual fund. It is then relatively easy to apply an assumed level of debt. Uh, to give a leveraged return, an artificially leveraged return, and then by applying uh, assumptions about costs and fees, you can get to uh, the equivalent of an NAV return that is comparable um, with the individual fund's return. So many, many possibilities. Um, and forgive the comment slightly cheesy graphic, but although this door is closing, I think many other doors are opening. Thank you for your attention.